study corner. Let's start our journey with chapter nutrition that is from biology. As you all know, every organism requires energy to live. This is provided from the food that it eats. However, every organism does not have the luxury to cook food or order food as we do. In fact, there are two major forms of nutrition. Autotrophic mode of nutrition and heterotrophic mode of nutrition. As you are already aware, autotroph is a biological term that's break down to mean self-nourishing. Hence, autotrophic organisms synthesize their own food from simple inorganic substances using photo photosynthesis. And in the heterotrophic nutrition, as the name suggests, is other nourishing, which effectively mean that they obtain their food from sources other than photosynthesis. Or the other way of looking at it is that they cannot synthesize their own food from simple inorganic substances, but directly consume organic substances. But this can be done in different ways. Autotrophs, organisms which are capable of synthesizing their own food from simple inorganic substances using light and chemical energy. So what we have established till now is that all organisms need to survive. The animals cannot make their own food, so they consume plants to meet their energy requirement. But the question is, how do plants make their own food? Well, plants have a power that humans can only dream of, making food from sunlight. Sure, we can cook some savory dishes, but to use food molecules that are already made by plants. This process of assembling food molecules fueled by the power of sunlight is called photosynthesis. Just to get to the word roots, the prefix photo means light and synthesis means to bring together. So the plants bring together carbon dioxide and water in the presence of sunlight and with the help of water molecule chlorophyll to produce glucose also oxygen is released as byproduct. Hence plants have an autotrophic mode of nutrition as they are independent of other organisms to give them food. How this process works can be understood in two perspectives. One is matter and the other is energy. In terms of matter, photosynthesis takes place in smaller, simpler material and assembles them into larger, more complex ones. In terms of energy, photosynthesis transforms the light energy of the sun into a form living things can access the stored chemical energy in food molecules. Just to re-emphasize and from an exam point of view, photosynthesis is the process where in the presence of chlorophyll, plants use the energy from the sun to synthesize food from raw materials like water and carbon dioxide. Now let us discuss the factors that are essential for the process of photosynthesis. Although the single most important factor is sun, the sun is important for both the light and the warmth that it provides to the plant. The importance of the temperature relates to the function of Calvin enzymes. In fact, these enzymes are optimally active between 10 degrees to 45 degrees Celsius. The importance of sunlight is also evident in the relationship between the time of the day and photosynthesis. The levels of photosynthesis highly correlate with the position of the sun in the sky. With photosynthesis grinding to a halt at night of the sun, after the sun has set. Another factor important for the rate of photosynthesis is the level of relevant gases oxygen and carbon dioxide are mainly important because their effect on the viscose activity. Interestingly, oxygen seems to have a um, second role in photosynthesis. What is that? This is demonstrated by the observation that the small amount of oxygen is required for the photosynthetic activity. Exactly what the oxygen is doing is not very well understood, but the prevailing theory states that the oxygen reacts with some of the pigments in the photosystems in the way that promotes the maintenance of their functions. Another set of factors to consider in the rate of photosynthesis are more biological in their basis. 
we discussed various factors that affect photosynthesis in plants. Why not we now experimentally test the requirement of some of these factors? But before we perform any experiment to test photosynthesis, there are some specific methods to keep in mind. The first one is destarching or removal of starch from plant is done by placing it in tar for 24 to 48 hours. In this step, the starch that is present in the leaf is either transported to the storage organs or is used up by the plants. These leaves are now free from starch. So now, if you test this leaf for starch, this would come up empty. But how do we test leaf for starch? Well, it's with the help of IOD test. Here the leaf which is to be tested is dropped in boiling water for about a minute. All the leaf cell are pretty much killed here because of the heat. Next, the leaf is placed in the tube containing methylated spirit. This solution is boiled on hot water bath. This step pretty much removes all the chlorophyll leaving it pale white. The leaf is hard and brittle by now. So it is washed with hot water to soften it, uh, soften it again. And finally, the leaf is spread out on a petri dish. Now, we prepare an iodine solution by taking 0.3 grams of iodine and 1.5 grams of potassium iodide in 100 ml of water. This iodine solution is then poured over the leaf. And, and if you look at the leaf, any part with the starch will appear blue-black in color. Fascinating, right? Well, now that we know how to destarch a plant and test the leaf with the iodine test, let's go on and perform our photosynthesis experiments. Carbon dioxide is yet another factor necessary for the process of photosynthesis. Let's not take it for granted and do an experiment to prove it. So once again, we'll destarch a plant. Then we shall partially insert a leaf into a flask that contains potassium hydroxide. Then we shall hold this particular setup using a split cork. We can observe that half of the leaf is inside the tube and the other half is outside. Now leave this kind of setup in sun for a few hours. Now we'll plug the leaf and test it for starch. The leaf inserted into the tube has turned blue-black in color. Well, why did this happen? It is because potassium hydroxide is a chemical that absorbs carbon dioxide. So this means that there would have been no carbon dioxide inside the tube. And that portion of the leaf has been negative for starch. Means photosynthesis does not occur in absence of carbon dioxide thereby proving our initial hypothesis that carbon dioxide is necessary for photosynthesis. Now let us perform an experiment to test the most important byproduct of photosynthesis that is oxygen. So to test if oxygen is produced by photosynthesis, we will take an aquatic plant, hydrilla or alodia. We will put this aquatic plant in a beaker and then invert a funnel on it such that it is not that the bottom of the flask. Next, we will take a test tube and fill it with water and invert the test tube on the flask. We will also create a control setup with exactly the same things except with no aquatic plant. We will keep both the control and the experiment the setup in the sun for a few hours. We can see that the setup with the plant has some air bubbles that are accumulated in the tube. Whereas the control setup had just water. So what are the air bubbles that are accumulated in the test tube? Must be oxygen, right? When we test it in this way, we will see that the splinter will burst into a flame, indicating that it is indeed oxygen. So with this, we can conclude that oxygen is the byproduct produced by photosynthesis. So we have also discussed how sunlight is absolutely necessary for photosynthesis. Let's prove this one as well experimentally. For this, we'll take a normal plant and destarch it. Then we'll take a black paper and cover just a part of the leaf. Let's leave this setup in the sun for a few hours. 
will then remove the black paper and test this leaf for starch. Results are going to be quite interesting here. You, what you will observe is that only the parts of the leaf that were exposed to sunlight test positive for starch, whereas the parts of the leaf that were covered with covered have just turned pale, indicating no starch whatsoever is produced in the absence of sun, sunlight. Now let us look at the reactions that occur in the chloroplast. One is light dependent reaction which receives sunlight and the other set where the light is not required is called a light independent reaction. Don't be scared by listening to such important sounding names. Let's call them the light reaction and the dark reaction. Let us look at light reaction. The chlorophyll absorbs the light carrying energy from the sun. You must have heard of solar powered water heaters and even cars nowadays. So think of our autotropes to be solar powered. Food making machines. Now the bond between the hydrogen and the oxygen in the water molecule is really difficult to break. The plants can break this bond on its own. So this is where our mighty sun comes into the rescue. The plant uses a part of energy absorbed from the sun for this purpose. Now the water molecule breaks the oxygen obtained from, from breaking upon of this water molecule is released into the atmosphere and hydrogen is used to energize the other particles. The other particle that I am talking about is the energy currency that we are speaking about, the ATP. And one more new guy, let us call him NADPH. He is kind of ATP's cousin. He can also deliver energy just like the ATP does. In India, the currency is rupee. In US, it is dollar. In Japan, it is yen. But all of them are currencies in their own right. All these currencies can buy what you want. Similarly, NADPH is also an energy currency just like the ATP. Therefore, the objective of the light reaction is to go ahead and produce these energy rich molecules the ATP and NADPH. The sun's radiant energy is converted by chlorophyll into chemical energy. So what happens to this chemical energy? Our next stage begins here. The dark reaction. The dark reaction was discovered by these two guys named Kelvin and Benson. So this process is also referred to by the names called Kelvin-Benson cycle sometimes. This chemical energy is what is stored in the form of ATP and NADPH molecules. The H part of NADPH molecule is actually the hydrogen which is split away from the water molecule. Now this energy from ATP and NADPH helps the CO2 to come to become a simple carbohydrate. The NADPH molecule donates the hydrogen for this uh, produce. Since the entire thing is a cycle and is continuous process, we really can't say which part the plant starts off with first. Much like how you don't know if your mom is going to start with cutting the vegetable first or making the dough for your rotis first or steam the rice. They are all just as important into the process of uh, food making. Now we have come to an end of this video. I hope that the topics that we covered today were crystal clear to you. I will come up with part 2 soon. Hit the like button and subscribe to my channel. Share it with your friends. Follow me on Insta and FB. Thank you for watching.